Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. Your home for engaging conversations about the topics that matter most in our culture. If you love nuance, if you want to better understand different points of view, if you're tired of the screamers taking all the oxygen out of the room, if you'll enjoy edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high-profile public figures and regular folks like me, you love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your co-host, Jessica, the reporter Stone. I usually have a drum roll there, but because I'm along with Corey Nathan, the creative genius and thoughtful interrogator behind what you see here, the TPNR, he's a guy who loves the Mets, he loves Jesus, and asking tough questions, but much more artfully frequently, I would argue, than I do. Uh, not exactly in that order. Corey, how you doing today? I am doing great. Wow. How refreshing to hear it from another voice. And I should let you do that more often. Maybe if uh, I, you know, say, say more nice things about me. Go we on. need to have some like, um, you know, crowd noise because I always feel like the way you introduced me, I picture myself as Rocky, like. Yeah. Coming in and getting high like, fives. Feeling yeah. strong now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and look at, uh, look at, we have this great guest today, Corey. I'm so excited about him. Um, and let's tell our audience a little bit about him. He's Ryan Burge, a pastor of American Baptist churches for the past 15 years and a doctor of political science. He is also the recent author of the very good book, The Nuns. And we're not talking about uh, Sister Mary over here, uh, where they came from, who they are and where they are going. Was that a giggle there, Ryan? A small smirk, maybe. <laughs> we, wanted, <laughs> we wanted to invite him on today, not just because he has a great sense of humor and tells us we can ask him anything and he'll answer it, but also because he has actually attempted to analyze objectively the reasons for a huge shift in American religiosity, that of the rise of those who do not have a religious affiliation. Uh, and in some of the surveys he cites, they are known as the nuns, hence the title of the book we will be discussing. His book begins with a major inflection point, which I actually remember, Ryan, as a journalist, remember in 2018 when the social science community realized that the nuns those who do not consider themselves to be a part of any religious group, but actually caught up with American evangelical Protestants and Roman Catholics in numbers. They currently stand, at least by that 2018 count, at 23.7% of the country. We're going to dive into how we got here, what this means for the future of our country, and American religious, religion itself. And with that, welcome, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being on. So good to have you here. Um, I wanted to get a little bit about your background before we dive into the book. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how you grew up in terms of both politics, religion, and time and place? Oh, man. I was born in a small town in rural Illinois in 1982, which um, when you're growing up, you don't realize you grew up in a weird time in American history until you kind of look back on it as an adult. And I like to say that I actually got a PhD in political science to figure out what in the world was going on with me growing up in a really <laughs> an, an evangelical Southern Baptist church in rural Illinois in the 1990s, which if you sort of look at American religious history, that's a weird time to be an evangelical in America because it was really the peak of American evangelicalism. They reached about 30 percent of America in 1993 abortion was just becoming this major, major boiling point issue in American politics. Um, things like purity culture were really started hitting their peak in the 1990s. There was a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Yeah, I was just going to say, Josh, what was his name? Josh Harris. Oh, right. And, he then, and, then, he, and then he got divorced, right? Or, or he walked away from his faith. Yes. Josh Harris's story is like, to me, is actually really emblematic of like how I grew up because he wrote that book when he was 20 years old. Um, was not even married yet, had no seminary degree, no, no college degree at all, wrote the book. It took off, sold hundreds of thousands of copies. In the last five years, he has gotten divorced, left Christ well, left his church as a pastor, left Christianity entirely, um, told his publisher to stop printing more copies of that book and done a documentary series with people who were hurt by that book when they read it in the 1990s. Wow. So he's had like a complete like his life is completely opposite of what it was 20 years ago. So Ryan, are you trying to tell us you had a dysfunctional childhood? Yeah. Um, 
I think it was like my parents loved me, but like I think a religion at some point like teaches you to love your kids in a way that only cares about their eternal salvation and their sinfulness. Yeah. Right. Like it doesn't really concern. It's like my parents' biggest fear in, in, in the world was I was going to die and go to hell. Mm. Um, and so I grew up in a church where like I grew up in a church where I was there two, three times a week. My grandmother was the secretary. My grandfather was the usher. My dad drove the church bus. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. And every one of my friends went forward and got Jesus, as they say in the evangelical tradition, at six, seven, eight, nine years old. And I was hanging around the whole time going, no, nah, that ain't for me. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, but that just doesn't work for me. And I remember when I was 13 or 14, my parents like basically had a come to Jesus talk with me in the living room where they read me all the scriptures and said, you know, if you die, you're going to go to hell and yada, yada, yada. I go, I get it. I know that Bible as well as you do at this point, because I've gone to church, you know, three, three times a week for 15 years now. And I just said, it's not for me. It doesn't work for me because I did not want to accept a faith because my parents wanted me to, or my youth pastor wanted me to, or, and, but I also didn't have like this charismatic come to Jesus moment where I was like, you know, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see for me, it was just going, okay, I believe this stuff enough to affirm that I'm a Christian. Like that was what my transition, it was like, it wasn't like an on off switch. It was like a dimmer switch. You know, where yeah. I went from, you know, being all in the darkness to somewhat in the light, but I still think my dimmer switch goes up and down, you know, day to day, week to week, month to month, even in my current life. So I, I, have, I have a question about that because I, I had a similar experience where I grew up very observantly Jewish. And then the season before I became a Christian, it was it was months. It was about six to nine months where I had this voracious, I still have a pretty voracious reading habit, but I mean, if you, if somebody took notes and clocked in, clocked out and said, Corey, you've been reading about 10 hours a day for the last six months. So the, when I finally prayed the prayer, you know, where I technically became a Christian, it was, um, it, it was more of a dimmer switch. It was like, I finally got to that point where I asked one of the fellows that I was, you know, going down this path with like, what's the prayer, you know, as a Jew, you're like, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech, I'm a Christian now, you know? Um, <laughs> he's like, <laughs> um, he's like, uh, no, just talk to God. So I talked to God. And then uh, I was often when I was sharing that testimony, I almost felt obligated to inject some of that, you know, that, that moment that like, oh, now I'm, you know, I, I once was born and now I'm saved kind of like that, that moment of like, oh, and it just hit me like a warm drops of rain. I don't know. Like, and, and it just wasn't that way. It was just this gradual thing of reading good theology and comparing other philosophies and then reading the new Testament and comparing, you know, Jesus's theology, especially, you know, starting in Matthew five. And like, I recognize this as the Var Torah. And it was, it was actually an all-inclusive process because it wasn't just this emotional thing that happened. It was as, you know, as the, the, the command says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you know, all of those things. So I'm wondering if you experienced something similar, like an obligation to inject the drama that, that is almost expected. That's the, and I talk about that. All, I have a, a new book. I'll, I'll talk about it later, but 20 myths about religion and politics in America is the title of the book. And one of the myths is that radical conversion is commonplace it's actually incredibly rare for people to have like this turning point moment in their lives where they like, they were literally lost. And, you know, like the stories you hear in evangelicalism is like, I was doing hardcore heroin, you know, and I, you know, I, I beat my wife and I abused my kids. Then I found Jesus. And all of a sudden I go to church three times a week and I wear a white collar to work every day. And I, you know, like in life's good, that story hardly ever happens. Mm. If you actually look at the data for people who become born again, 25% of them go to church more after they become born again, and 20% go less oh, wow. after they become born again. But the modal outcome, the most average outcome is they go exactly the same amount afterwards as they did before, right? So it's like what we're taught. But the thing is, like, my story and your story, Corey, are, are boring, you know, from like a, a dramatic <laughs> standpoint, right? Like, no one's going to make a movie about my life story because it's not like I was once yeah. lost and now I'm found. Except for the Jew from Jersey part of it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the That's Jewish pretty part funny. <laughs> is a bit more compelling than mine. I'll, I'll, I'll fully admit that. Um, but at, this, at the end of the day, like most of our stories of conversion are, are gradual sliding towards one thing or another. They're not, you know, change is hard. My parents both had fairly radical 1970, circa 1972 turnarounds in the Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, baptized in the Pacific Ocean, married in Golden Gate Park. Yada, yada. So 
Yeah, I, I never tell my story because it's <laughs> not as good as their story. <laughs> yeah, I became yeah. a Christian when I was seven. Yeah. Yeah. My life was different after at seven. I can totally remember all the things I did differently when I was seven, not. Um, yes, yeah, so it's interesting that the data doesn't show that people have big turning points. And yet the Hollywood version of conversion is much more stark. But you know, what's interesting, like the 1970s were like really when evangelicalism started to like inject itself into like mainstream American culture, like 1976 time magazine called the year of the evangelical. Cause oh, Jimmy wow. Carter, you know, was running for office and he was a Southern Baptist evangelical and like, it became like a mainstream idea. And you started seeing like the idea of becoming born again, like radical conversion actually became part of like mainstream discourse. It didn't happen a bunch, but people knew and were sort of aware of the idea of it. And that really kind of hit from the 1970s to the 19 early 1990s, which really like when evangelicalism, like became mainstream in a lot of weird ways. And I, I think, like I was talking to somebody just two days ago about like being born in 1982 is so interesting because if I was born 20 years earlier, I could have a lot of options as a Protestant Christian because other churches were st really strong in the 70s, right? Like the Episcopalians, the United Methodists and the Church of Christ mm -hmm. and stuff. But if I was born 20 years later, I'd be a nun right now. Mm. Like I'm almost convinced that I would have no religious tradition at all because the main line, which is what I'm a member of now, which is like moderate Protestant Christianity just does not exist in a meaningful way anymore. Like it did even 20 years ago. So like it all goes back to this idea of being born in the early eighties is re a really weird way to grow up in American religion. I don't think we've ever seen anything like it, at least in the last hundred years. You just want to be special, Ryan. Come on. <laughs> don't we all, I'm a snowflake. I watched fight club so much when I was in college, like you are not a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what that movie talks about a lot, you know, like the idea, like conformity, right? Like we're, we yeah. are, we're all like the whole generation, like we're the generation with participation trophies and all that stuff. You know, who gave us, you know, who gave us participation trophies though? Our boomer parents did. So don't <laughs> blame eight year old me for taking a participation trophy. I didn't ask for it. You gave it to me. Yeah. So you wanted me, you wanted you me got to feel into like the idea though, at eight years old, that you should just get a trophy for doing something mediocre. I'm sorry. That's just not how the world works. Guess what? My eight, my seven-year-old lost a front tooth yesterday and got five bucks for it. Didn't ask a <laughs> single question about it. <laughs> right. Don't tell I mean, me you're raising more, more, uh, you're a hover parent. What do they call you? A, a air helicopter parent. Uh, thank you. Helicopter parent. Uh, let's just say that, um, in our family, we have one parent who's a little bit more proactive and make sure the kids don't die. And I'm one who's a little less and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in the second camp on that. Yeah. There you go. But so far they're living. <laughs> uh, they've survived nine years and seven years and they've only gone to the hospital once each. So I guess that's, that's uh, my, and my kids have been on antibiotics once in their entire lives. So I guess we're doing relatively okay. They're kind of jerks sometimes, but you know, that, that reminds me of uh, Kevin Pilar. He's a, uh, he's an outfielder for the Mets and he got hit in the face really bad about three weeks ago. I mean, his face just blew up. And right afterwards, he hadn't even gone into surgery yet. And he's like, you know, I've had about 3,000 at bats. I've only been hit in the face twice because he got hit in the face before a few years ago. And he's like, I like my odds. <laughs> it's a great attitude, right? You know what I tell my kids? They're going to do something really dumb. I don't tell them to not do it. I just say, I'm going to get in the car and warm it up so we can go to the hospital <laughs> and, and let them make their own decisions. Yeah. And luckily, they've not done the dumb thing yet. I'm, yeah. I'm sure they're, it's my, my oldest. coming. Well, my oldest the other day was like, I'm going to get in trouble in college, aren't I? I'm like, oh, oh, yes, absolutely yeah. you will. And I and I said to my wife secretly, I kind of want you to get in trouble when you go to college because, like, that's fun. Uh, just don't tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. We have this expression, gravity always wins. Gravity's undefeated. Undefeated. That's <laughs> yes, right. So. Jess, Jess, we want to know, like, about the, the, the background, how you became a doctor, all the schooling. Yeah, this no, we do. But um, I guess, you know, that's sort of like the bio, but I guess I'm interested in this, the tension you talk about in your book, this, this sort of tension between being a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. You're sort of invested in the outcome of the research that you do, but yeah. then also you have a very stringent uh, quantitative mm -hmm. analysis. Um, how did those threads weave into your approach to uh, the intersection of religion and politics? How did you, and, and, and was that part of the story of how you got into this field? You know, that's, that's a really, that's like the thing that I like keeps me up at night is thinking about like how I can still be a pastor, but still be an honest broker of the data. I tell people mm -hmm. that all the time. Like, I really want to see myself and I really do try to position myself 
as an honest broker, like a neutral referee for everybody, like every religious tradition, I hope understands that I don't play for you nor against you. My job is just to show you, and I talk about that in the book, like my job is to show you the way the world exists, not the way you hope it to be or wish it to be, but the way it actually exists, right? There's this great, great James Baldwin quote, nothing can, um, not everything that can be faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced, mm. right? I think like that's, at some point, I'm the guy who makes you face the thing right? And say, here's what it is. So, you know, the book is like five chapters and the first four, you're right, just are just like straight up, like neutral, observant quant. Charts, data. people, charts. Lots of charts and graphs. There's like 42 charts. graphs in 160 pages. Like they're all- that's I've never seen some of these kind of graphs. That's called a bee swarm plot. Yeah. I never saw a bee swarm plot besides a bee swarm. Bee swarm plot is what it's called. Yeah. I tried, I'm, I'm a big, I spent a lot of time like trying to make my data visualizations good, which is also awful when you write a book because they have to be in black and white. And that really sort of kills a yeah. lot of the goodness. Like the, the, the color is what makes a lot of them pop. And you have to strip all. So I actually had to redo all the graphs twice. Oh, wow. For the book. Because the editor wanted one thing. And then it went to with the actual, like the people who print the book and go, yeah, this is not going to print right. you got to go back and fix this and change that. And it was like, that was honestly the hardest part of writing the whole book was getting the graphs right. Yeah. But the first four chapters are just like rugged quant data stuff. And then the chapter, the fifth chapter is like me kind of putting the pastor hat back on a little bit. Yeah. And I kind of say there's like there's, the way you need to think about the world is there are some things that can change in this world and some things that can't and figure out what can change and what can't change. And a lot of things, a lot of the reasons the nuns have risen is for reasons that we can't change. Secularism was going to happen in America to say it wasn't is just to ignore all social science theory. It just took a long time to get here from Europe and it went a lot slower, but it's here. The wave is cresting now across the American landscape and pastors are beating their heads against the wall. Like, why are we smaller? Why are there a few butts in seats? Why is the offering down? Listen, a lot of it was outside your control. So take a breath, take a step back and say, it's okay. I didn't do that. And then focus on things you can change. Yeah. I had a related question to that. Um, in a recent piece for Religion Unplugged, you noted that it, it's sort of the uh, the other side of this. You noted that Trump held steady among believers, but lost the non-religious vote. So mm -hmm. just kind of pivoting to ask more about the political side and digging into the numbers from 2016 to 2020 in that piece, Trump, pick, Trump picked up a couple points among white evangelicals, non-white evangelicals, black Protestants, white Catholics, non-white Catholics, and other smaller religious groups. Meanwhile, he lost share among those identifying as atheists, agnostics, and nothing in particular, or nuns, as, as uh, you call it in your book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then factoring in something you said in the book, as evangelicals have become more linked to one political party, that has naturally led to the alienation of a lot of people who think differently about politics. Mm -hmm. So uh, picking up on what you were just talking about, can you deduce some causes or do you see some patterns emerging either in your work as a political scientist or as a pastor? Yeah, I think that the untold story of American society over the last 30 or 40 years, we talk about political polarization all the time. Like it dominates every headline, every news story, every pundit on TV talks about political polarization, but they miss the fact that religious polarization has been happening at almost the same rate as political polarization, yet we don't talk about it as much for reasons I don't fully understand. I do think, and I hate saying this, the media is biased against religion because most reporters are not religious and did not grow up religious. I think it's incredibly telling that the best religion reporters in America were born and raised in the Midwest and evangelical households. I mean, most people that work at the Post, most people that work at the Times, people that work at the RNS, people that work at Christianity Today, all grew up Christian. Like, I mean, I think there's something about it. Like, people either get religion or they don't. And it's, I can always tell when a reporter calls me who has no background in religion because they just don't even get the rules of the game, right? Like, yeah. even like the broad structure of how religion works. But I, so what we're seeing though is we're seeing like the coastal elites, you know, the Excel Corridor, as they call it, you know, DC to New York and Boston. Most people there, yay, but most people there are non-religious or they're culturally religious, but not religiously religious, right? Like it's it's a part of their life, but only from a cultural standpoint. Yeah. So they don't get this thing that's been going on, which is now we what we have in America used to be in the 1970s, 55% of Americans were not born again, but were not nuns. So they were in the middle of the sort of religious spectrum, 55% in the 1980s. Today, it's 35%. 
41% of Americans say they're born again. 25% of Americans say that they're religiously unaffiliated now, which means that the, the, the middle is shrinking rapidly in America, and there's no place for what I call polite Christianity anymore. You know, what I mean by that is people were like, am I going to heaven or hell? I don't know, but my job is to love my neighbor as myself and, you know, feed hungry kids and, and welcome the stranger and be a good person and be a good parent. Like that kind of Christianity is dead because what's killed it on one side is the nuns have risen. But on the other side, it's a bunch of evangelicals telling people like me that I'm not a real Christian because I don't believe in all the doctrines that they believe in. Right. So we've seen a sorting out and this in the, the political sorting has followed the religious sorting. Right. So yeah. who who has become the base of the Democratic Party today? It's the religiously unaffiliated. They are the base now of the Democratic Party. Who has become the base of the Republican Party in America today? It's evangelicals, which are the most conservative flavor of American religion right now. So you have nuns on one side, evangelicals on the other side, Republicans, Democrats, and very few people laying in the middle anymore. It's really sort of tragic in a lot of ways. Wow. That's really remarkable and it and some of the things that are going through my head right now have to do with the conversations we had like with emily matthews and daniel Hare or elizabeth newman where does that leave the people who would describe themselves as simply followers of jesus or followers of a tradition of a monotheistic religion because because really most of this book is really about the church it's not about judaism or or, or the mosque yeah. um, or islam yep. um muslims um where does that leave what I with the sort of thinking evangelicals, the people mm -hmm. who arrived at it cognitively, not just emotionally? There, I mean, there's a there's a tradition called mainline Protestant Christianity, which is which is uh, like a, United Methodists are the largest denomination, but it's like Episcopalians, United Church of Christ, American Baptists, which is what I are, what I are, what I am. Oh, <laughs> um, but we are like, for instance, most of these churches, all these churches allow women to be pastors. And many of them are affirming LGBT lifestyles will do gay weddings and things like that. Um, they used to be 30% of Americans were mainline Protestants in the late 1970s, 30%. Today, they're 10% of Americans, and they're going to be 5% of Americans in the next 10 years. The average mainline Protestant is about 60 years old today. They represent that thinking kind of version of Christianity. Like the, the typical mainline Protestant is someone who's like got a graduate degree, you know, makes six figures a year, white upper middle class, had two kids, but now, you know, are empty nesters or have grandkids and things like that. They go to church once or twice a month. But if you ask them if they're going to go to heaven or hell, they go, I don't even know if I believe in heaven or hell. You know, you ask about the end times, like we don't even talk about the end times, right? My church does good things because we have potlucks and we feed hungry people. Like that's the kind of Christianity that was used to be a home for people like us, you know, used to embrace us and say, hey, we're doubters too. Welcome to the club. Those churches are dying rapidly now, and we're only being left with the certainty of evangelicalism on one side and the vast uncertainty of the nuns on the other side, and we're really spiritually homeless. And I yeah. think that's sort of, I want to write that memoir. We're talking about like, you know, like I said, if I was born 20 years earlier, I would have been a great mainline Protestant. I had so many, you know, the huge congregation, lots of money, a lot of programs. Those churches are dead now. So yeah. I really have no options for my spiritual future. And if I wasn't a pastor in the in the mainline tradition, I don't know where I would go. I'd probably go to mass with my wife once or twice a month because I do enjoy mass at some level, although I still feel like I don't belong there because I'm not Catholic and won't become Catholic for a bunch of, you know, whatever reasons. But that would be my only option. But I think I like what the Catholic Church is. They don't try to beat you over the head with anything. You know, they kind of just let you come and go as you please, which is what I want. I would want in a church. But I really... I believe in I believe in Christianity so deeply, and I believe that you know Jesus is so important to me in my life. But gosh, it is hard, especially in rural America, to find people who think about things the way that I think about things. And I know if I didn't have a church, because I lead a church that does that, there wouldn't be a church like that for me. And it really kind of breaks my heart, to be honest with you. So along this this hits on both the sociological as well as the theological. I. I take my Bible seriously. I take it as authoritative. I don't know what the right words are to say, you know, literal or that. I just don't find some of those terms sufficient uh, because every book, every passage, it needs to be met on its own terms, but I take it authoritatively, right? And because I take it authoritatively, I find myself very much at odds with uh, some of the um, evangelical churches or kids went to a Christian school that was very, very much uh, American evangelical, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, so I found myself at odds with that. I often said, man, like if we read the chapter before and the chapter after, let alone the whole chapter that this verse is being uh, scalpeled out of, 
uh, I just don't think it's saying that. It doesn't look like it's saying that. So I'm wondering if you've made any observations either in your work as a political scientist or uh, in conversations with other pastors from other churches or just you know around friends and family that people, the American evangelical movement seems to start with positions and back scripture into it, as opposed to actually starting with the scripture and reckoning with what the scripture is saying. Mm -hmm. well, you have a very Jewish understanding of the Bible. Corey. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm serious. Like I, I've read a lot. Like I, I really dig into like the old Testament a lot and read about like Jewish culture and like Jewish, the Jewish worldview, especially like the worldview that Jesus grew up with and the way yeah. they understood the world. And like, you know, when, when kids were growing like boys, cause it was, you know, misogynistic culture and that. Yeah. In we that didn't time. exist. Yeah, I know. A Jewish, there was a Jewish prayer. That every boy woke up and thank God that he wasn't born a woman and wasn't born a dog. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Like that's how misogynistic first century Jewish culture was. It was <sighs> awful. But beyond that, um, when, when boys would go to, you know, they would go through Talmud, right. They would go, they would learn, they would learn the first five books. They would memorize them by the time they were eight. Yeah. They would memorize the entire old Testament by the time they were 13. And if they wanted to become a rabbi, they would have to go to another rabbi and say, I want to be your follower. But what they would ask, what they would, the, the rabbi would open the scriptures and say, what does this passage mean? And now here's where the really important part was. The rabbi would not be listening for one answer. He'd be listening for many answers. Yeah. Yeah. Because he'd want his disciple to say, well, here's what rabbi so-and-so thinks it means. And here's what rabbi so-and-so thinks it means. But then there's this possibility too. And, and really he what, he what the rabbi wanted to see was that disciple rolling the ideas over in his head thinking yeah. through the implications and complications that go through. They say that the, the Torah is like a jewel, like a diamond. Every time you turn it, you see something different, right? And so there's not one interpretation. There's many interpretations, but unfortunately, evangelicalism has taught conformity. Mm. Like what you talked about, like there is only one way to read the Bible. And, you know, I have so many, like, I have so many pastor friends on Facebook because, you know, just being a pastor, you pick those people up over time. They, I, I, they will berate the Democratic Party all over their Facebook page, almost to the point where I want to say to them, can you be a Democrat and be a Christian? Like, can I walk into your church and be a Democrat? And would you consider me a full, you know, full fellowship believer with you? Because I think some of them would say no. Right. My response to that is, do you think that Martin Luther King Jr. was a Christian? Do you think that he was really a Christian or not? Because he was a Democrat, but in every possible way understood the scriptures, but in a way that differs from you. So which is more important, that you believe in the dogma of Christianity, which I think is expressed through the Apostles' Creed, or that you believe all the doctrines too? Because it seems like a lot of evangelicals think that doctrine has become dogma, mm. right? To me, I believe very few things, but I believe them a lot. And everything else to me is you can believe whatever in the world you want as long as you don't tread on my do on my dogma, right? So things like women pastors, LGBT, view of race, view of immigration. Like I don't agree with you, but I don't think it takes you out of fellowship as a Christian because you have a different view than I do as long as we agree on dogma. But unfortunately, a lot of evangelicals say unless you believe all these things, then yeah. you are not a real Christian. And that's the problem that I have with American evangelical Christianity. Right, right. Yeah, and there are some tough ones in there. I was just taking a deeper dive on well, where exactly does it say that life starts at conception? And I, I've, this is a controversial one, obviously, because I do happen to believe that life starts at conception, partly from what I'm reading in the Bible, but partly from science. You science. Know, um, but what I derived from doing a lot of reading about it is like, we got to be a little bit more holistic about this. God doesn't just care about the the fetus. God cares about the mother. God cares about the fetus. God cares about the, the, the creation father? that we're leaving behind the father, the, you know, um, the, the, the child a, a, when, when it comes outside the womb, the, in fact, God, 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 God loves the, the mother and the father and the child, even if they are born on the other side of an imaginary line <laughs> that, that we call our, uh, Wait our borders. A minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. No, there's this something there's in, in the Catholic faith. One thing I really appreciate is they have what's called a consistent ethic of life. It's also called the seamless garment, yeah. which is it means that life should be protected from conception and natural death, yeah. which means that abortion's wrong, but also war capital is generally punishment. wrong. Euthanasia is wrong. Capital punishment's wrong. Anything that, that, that devalues life at any stage 
is wrong, is morally, yeah. we should be morally opposed to it. That's why I find the, the evangelical position is incredibly interesting, right? Because it's like, protect that fetus at all costs, but we're going to kill a whole bunch of people. The state is yeah. going to kill a whole bunch of people with capital punishment. You cannot look me in the eye and tell me that this one state in, in, in the United States has not killed an innocent person in the last 20 years. You cannot say that. It's impossible to say that. And to me, the Christian worldview is I'd rather have a thousand innocent or guilty men go free than one innocent man be put to death. Like mm. that's just my understanding of the scriptures, right? That that I'm a – it sounds so like hippy-dippy, but I believe in a Christianity that builds bigger tables, not taller walls, right? Like I'm an inclusive mm. guy. I think the kingdom belongs to all of us, right? I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what your background is. And I remember you were talking to Linda about – communion linda feldman about communion and I, I just think there's so much like i grew up in an evangelical tradition we didn't call it communion we call it the lord's supper which i think is like a terrible term for it like because think about what the word communion means it means to commune to be together, together, together right yeah. to come together at the table but what i tell my people is before we take it i go listen we're not just sharing with the people in the room right now we're sharing with people all over the world right in asia in africa in south america in antarctica people are taking communion today but we're also just communing. like the jews we do it we do the shabbat dinner every friday right exactly we have, right next year in jerusalem we celebrate the passover at the same time just trying to get in on our action aren't you yeah that that's well listen we're christians are just we just took jewish tradition and twisted it and turned it into our own thing i mean there's so many parallels between the old testament and the new testament like that's really what there's actually a huge argument that the new testament is basically just a somewhat rewriting of what happened in the old testament with different stories and different people i mean the parallels are insane if you think about it right have you read a lot of nt Wright stuff tom Wright stuff Oh yeah, in college we had to read N.T. Wright's like considered like the greatest like mainline theologian going today. I love him. Four Gospels, One Jesus, great book. Yeah, yeah, he's the man. Uh, so it, it, especially the first of the big volumes that he wrote, uh, mm -hmm. New Testament of the People of God, it helped me reimagine that it, it historically well well researched uh, reimagine first century Palestine. No, it, you know I, I'm just sitting here thinking about how your conversation is striking me um, because I really think like look your relationship with God is a different framing than religion, than Christianity or than American Christianity. I mean, I'm seeing, even just thinking like, what are my books behind or somewhere I have the history of the church and in, in the United States. And one thing that I feel like I could say, I could say this really spiritually and the Holy spirit moved me, or I could say it this way, like it, it must grieve God who just wants a relationship with his creation to think of how, complicated we make it all when he just he made us because he delights in us he loves us he gave us a way to be with him for eternity through his son and it's like not really that complicated but we make it that complicated is that always what it is though i mean re religion it's it's very core is the purest thing ever right i mean christianity is the purest thing ever if you really sit back and think about it we believe in sacrificial love we believe that someone loved us so much that he died for all of us. I guess, I guess for me, those words, um, and I think this is something that goes even to why people aren't identifying themselves. You talk about the, the labeling. For me, some of those labels are just like, listen, I know what I am. I know what my relationship is with God. But when I start to put labels on it that give people, um, you know, put me in a box, I, I'm not okay with that. I, I, I specifically identify myself as a follower of Jesus because that's what I am at its core. You're making my life as a survey researcher really hard, so stop doing that. <laughs> Call yourself a crit. When we were in college, no, we were real. Part of what you're talking about is is labeling, and part of it is mm -hmm. also talk, talking about, you know, the, the idea that we have to have some a person. I mean, evangelicals are also responsible for ha uh, giving us the idea and returning us to the idea that we need to have a personal relationship mm -hmm. with our God, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that's also destructive, though, too, because what it says is that society's problems aren't my problems. My problems are my problems. You know what I mean? Like, like the idea, you know, like critical race theories, like what everyone's talking about right now, which is the idea that like certain institutions in America are institutionally racist, systemically racist, housing, education, policing, the judicial system in general. By the way, there's tons of data that backs this up. Like academics do not even like debate the issue that like the police are systemically racist and the justice system. If you look at sentencing, black people get sentenced to longer sentences than white people for the same crime all the time, right? But the problem is the reason that evangelicals reject that idea is because they believe in personal responsibility, right? Like it's not institutions that keep black people down. It's black people that keep people, black people down. Like I could get, I can get ahead in life because of what I rise and fall on my own merits. 
But like, I think evangelicalism in some ways co-opted that idea and really like latched on to like the American view of capitalism, which is that you rise and fall on your own merits, right? You got rich, you got ahead because you're smart and you worked hard, not because what society did for you. So what they, what white people say to black people is, well, I got ahead, so you should get ahead. But critical race theory says, no, no, no. Black people have a harder time because the system's basically stacked against them from the very beginning. And the evangelicals say, but it doesn't matter what's stacked against you. You work hard, you're smart, you try, and you'll get ahead. So I think in some ways, like that theology has leaked into, or it's either everything's like related to each other, but that theology perpetuates the idea that we didn't do anything, I did something, which yeah. I think is actually unbiblical, by the way. If you right. look at like the prophets, Isaiah, when he sees God in Isaiah chapter six, he goes, woe is me, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips and mine eyes have seen the king, right? I live amongst a people of unclean lips. So he recognizes his own sinfulness, but then he recognizes the sinfulness of his society, right? So we have, I think we have to hold both those things in tension that I am in some level judged, not just on what I say or what I do, but what I do for the society around me and trying to make it more just, more perfect, and in my estimation, more like the kingdom of God. So, yeah. I just quoted the scripture. I apologize. I won't do that again. <laughs> I like it. Now, I was thinking of Matthew 23 before. When we, we are. We are about... uh, what did you tell our, our previous guest this week that we are, we're, we're allowed to have all kinds of, what was it? We're X-rated or we're, oh, we have a, we explicit. have a rating that explicit where we, we have an explicit rating. So you yeah. can, you can use scripture. If you need our to. prior guest, you don't want to say Anthony Scaramucci. <laughs> no, not, not really. <laughs> the mooch. We had the mooch. It was awesome. He was Let awesome. Let me just assure you, he did not quote scripture. <laughs> no, he didn't. But, the, <laughs> but actually, he did use choice words. He's very well read and he did quote some other quotes that were, that were yeah. very erudite. Um, so I want to drill down on some, some of the politics stuff. Uh, yeah. In a 2019 analysis in the Washington Post, why young white evangelicals aren't likely to leave the Republican Party, along with your collaborators, you say scholarship has shown that once social identities and partisanship are linked, motivated reasoning and negative partisanship make that link remarkably resistant to change. So two questions about this. Mm -hmm. Someone like Trump can come along and hijack the lingo of evangelicalism, not not even very well, like one Corinthians or an upside down Bible. Um, uh, and all our friends from church seem to fall all over themselves and use those instances as, as proof that he supposedly like he's saved. He's one of us. To, so just to ask a question bluntly, why is that? Because politics rules everything around us. Mm. I mean, that's the most depressing thing I can say. Like I use, like I have this line where I used to always tell everybody that we, we, we used to believe that like religion was the first lens and then politics was the second lens. And now we believe that like those lenses are opposite of each other. Like politics yeah. is the first lens now and everything mm -hmm. is sort of downstream from that. I don't even know if it's always, if it's not always been that way, like where yeah. politics has always been the first cause. But I think it's definitely true now because everything is partisan. Everything is partisan. covid was partisan. Right. Vaccines are partisan, right? right? Everything is partisan. So what we see now is, and by the way, you just bought a great term, which is negative partisanship, Corey. Negative partisanship is the idea that you don't vote for somebody, you vote against the other person, right? right? I didn't vote for Trump in 2016. I voted because I hate Hillary Clinton's guts. And actually, I think there's probably a lot to be said about the reason that Donald Trump won in 2016 is not because he was great. It's because people hate Hillary Clinton, like yeah. a blind hatred, especially white dudes, hate Hillary Clinton. That was the second part of my question. Uh, but expanding that out a little bit, it seems that many specific issues are fungible. But a, the primary defining factor of Trumpism that we see playing out in our churches is negative partisanship, meaning whatever we may think on taxes or infrastructure or anything, we all agree we hate not just Hillary Clinton, but all those radical leftist Marxist elites of the Democrat Party. That I was yesterday. I had a conversation. One of my my, my students teach me all kinds of interesting stuff. One wrote a uh, a capstone paper on plastic bag bans, <laughs> which are a really interesting piece of policy. Like I know no one. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, turn it off. Let's go to the next podcast. But listen to this. So in the state of Indiana, Indianapolis passed a ban on plastic bags in this in the, in the city limits. You can't use plastic bags at like grocery stores in Indianapolis. The state legislature of Indiana passed a law saying that you cannot ban plastic bags in the state of Indiana. They banned the ban <laughs> on plastic bags. 
And how much in taxpayer dollars were wasted because they couldn't just figure it out without wasting time? It, but think about what is one of the hallmarks of republicanism is local government yeah. is better than any other level of government, right? Like, am I, am I crazy? That's not, ob that's objectively true. That's what yeah. Thomas Jefferson believed, yeah. right? Like republicanism is the idea that local government's the best. And then what happens when the local government passes a law? The state government steps in and says, we don't like that law, right? But that's what partisanship does. It says, we don't have ideals. Right. We don't have like a, a coherent view of governance. All we care about is winning. Right. And whatever it takes to win is if we redraw the maps where if Republicans get 50 percent of the votes, but 70 percent of the seats in the state legislature, that's OK, is not OK. Yeah. Like that is fundamentally wrong and it actually breaks democracy in a lot of ways. But unfortunately, it's all about negative partisanship now. It's to own the libs or own the conservatives or whatever. You know, we, we want to make the Trumpers cry or we want to make the libs cry. Like if that is where we are today, then it's all about being the heck out of our opponents. And what happens is my buddy Paul Jupe has this idea called the inverted golden rule. It's to do to others what they would do, to, what you think they would do to you if they were in the same position you were, which means if you're in the majority, stuff it down their throats as long as you can, which is exactly what politics has become, right? It's not, you know what, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, they shouldn't have replaced her. And that's not a partisan statement. They should have waited for the election and done it afterwards. But you know what the Republicans realized? We're probably going to lose. And you know what the Democrats are going to do? They're going to cram it down our throats for two or four years. So let's cram it down their throats while we still can. That sure. is not a way to run a country. And unfortunately, religion, I think, just makes that worse. Because what it does is say our side is righteous and their side is evil. That's the problem is it's not – this. we have different views of governance. It's one is good and one is evil, and I think that's where we get into this. You know what that does? That justifies January 6th because that's a righteous crusade. We're, mm. we're taking America back from the evil socialists. That's why those people were justified because they felt like God was on their side, and to be honest with you, that's not a whole lot different than what happened on 9-11 when those guys threw those planes in that building. God is on our side. We're doing what God wants us to right. do. And I don't care if it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, or whatever you want to call it. When we start saying God's on our side, we're getting in a lot of trouble. I do have a question uh, as a follow-up to that. Uh, just after January 6th in religion and in, in religion in public, you took a look at who Trump's most ardent supporters are. Yeah. Um, among other factors, you shared data that indicates a much higher percentage of Trump supporters I identify as evangelical than the rest of the country by like two to one, actually more than two to one. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, you say it really succinctly in the nuns. In essence, devout Protestant Christians are Republicans with very few exceptions. So are we at a point in our devout Protestant churches where there is more of a permission structure to be openly supportive of QAnon and those who storm the Capitol than for someone who might have voted for a Democrat here and there? Absolutely. I think in most white evangelical mm. churches today, you would get a lot more support if you said you were in favor. See, here's what... You know what evangelical pastors do, by the way, which is really insidious. They won't go up from the pulpit and say, QAnon's real, believe in QAnon. What they'll say when they're asked about QAnon is, well, I don't have any evidence either way. And you know what that does? That gives permission to those people to go, well, my pastor didn't say it was wrong. Yeah. Right. So, you know, they, they, by, by being trying to yeah, be. Yeah, you neutral. talk about that, especially in an, in an age of the internet, that, that, that everything that a pastor is doing online and all of the other ways they communicate outside of that hour, hour and a half on Sunday morning are actually giving more permission than, and more direction to the congregants than maybe the, that time on Sunday morning when they're preaching. Uh, that's, that's like the conclusion of my book to pastors is stop being so partisan on social media. Like, are, are, do, I mean, what do they think they're gaining by doing that is my question. Cause they have to believe they're like, they're reinforcing their base, right? Because what you're doing is turning Gosh, off. Guys, I, I'm not, I don't like, so this is where I go. I don't, I don't see this where I live. Yeah. I don't, um, I, my, my, pa my first pastor that married us is, is in his seventies. <laughs> he's not on social media. <laughs> he, yes, he's conservative politically, but you only know that, um, typically he, he has gotten more vocal recently, but typically, you know, that when you have a personal conversation with him, mm -hmm. um, and the millennial pastor that is pastoring my church now, I mean, we have a church full of immigrants and a church that meets, that is the hand and feet, you know, they're, they're much more community oriented um, than the churches I was part of in the 90s and the, and the aughts, as they call them. Um, 
So I'm not saying it's not happening, but I keep I keep experiencing shock. I mean, it's the same thing with with our conversation with Elizabeth Newman and this whole construct around seeker sensitive and how the, the movement in the 90s of pulling more people into the church by watering down the gospels and making it much less about hell and much more about topical sermons and how to live your life. I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I mean, don't, don't pastors know that they're accountable for that? They don't have to worry about it. My county, the county I grew up in, Marion County, Illinois, 38,000 people. My first election was 2000, 5148 Bush. Toss up County, right? 5148. Yeah. 2020, 75, 25. Man, wow. I mean, there are no, I, I mean, I, I, I literally go around my entire life. I live in a county now of 40,000 people. I, I don't, I, I know I can probably name all the people who vote for Democrats on one hand that I know. I mean, all the social media chatter, like all the community groups, the Facebook community groups of, you know, the county I live in. And, so is and this, I mean, is this rural? Is this rural or the Midwest? Is that what, yes. is that? It's the rural. Because I, the, I'm usually the one under siege in the Northeast. <laughs> I'm usually the one that's not. <laughs> You know, that's on the edge of the, the party going, I'm uncomfortable with what is here, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go, you know, but I'm not, but I'm not here to proselytize. I'm here to like learn, you know, that's usually the way I treat new situations. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm not really used to being the dominant culture. The rural Midwest is lost for the, for the Democratic Party for now and forever. White people have fled the Democratic Party in by the millions over the last 20 years. And driven largely by, you know, the right the rise of twenty four seven news media beginning, you know, around thirty years ago, but really accelerating with Facebook. I mean, I think we cannot. If you look, there's actually a Twitter account that shows you the top ten most shared Facebook posts every day and who shared them. Every day, eight of the ten at least are conservative voices. At mm. least conservatives dominate Facebook. And who's on Facebook in the rural Midwest? My mom, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, it's dominated by 50, 60, 70-year-old people. That's yeah. their only form of social. They don't go on TikTok. They don't go on Twitter, right? They don't do Snapchat. So all they see, and they cater their feed in such a way, they don't ever hear the other side. They never hear the other side. They only hear Nancy Pelosi is dumb. AOC is dumb. Joe Biden is a blubbering idiot, right? Yeah. That you never hear the other side, at least back in the day with legacy media, NBC might have been biased slightly to the left, but at least you got a little bit of both, right? Now you can cater your feed and never have cognitive dissonance at all. By the way, it happens on the left too. I don't want to hear it like, oh, it's only the right wing. The left wing does the same thing. I just think they're bad at it. <laughs> they're not as good at it as the right wing is to cater their media. But pastors now live in an echo chamber where to be a white Christian in rural America is to be a Republican. So why not just cater to your base and reinforce your base and talk about culture war issues every Sunday because people are going to give you the amen and the backslap when you're done and you get to keep your job. It just becomes a self-reinforcing cycle. I'm thinking about some of the liberal friends uh, or progressive friends that I have that might be listening. And that I, I try to listen with their ears and see through their eyes as much as I can. And I'm thinking that uh, hearing your introduction and hearing us talk for a bit, what will resonate is that this guy's a pastor. He knows his Bible. He's, you know, they would register you as a Christian, as a religious person, maybe oh, even so, having yeah. some conservative views. But I suspect that there really is. I'm curious. Well, frankly, I'm curious what your conversations are like with your mom, with your mother-in-law, you know, those folks who are on Fox News 24-7. I don't mm -hmm. know if they are necessarily, but, you, you know, that that um, the, the proxy for that folk those folks do, yeah. do, does your voicing some opinions just render you as an utter marxist you know just mm. I, i'm curious how that's how that goes i'm very clear with um like my parents said something one time about a year ago about lgbt people and i said if my if one of my sons is gay you're going to love him as much as you love all your other grandkids and if you don't then he won't come around you mm. i was exceedingly clear about that right like i will not allow you to see my children as less than because of your understanding of scripture I just won't allow it for his personal mental health and my my mental health as well. Like I have very clear, bright lines about things that I think are acceptable and things that are unacceptable. But I am constantly telling people, just because I am not as conservative as you doesn't mean I'm a liberal. Right. You know, like I think there, I think we for, we forget the idea how far the Republican Party has moved to the right over the last twenty years. Right? Mm -hmm. There's this idea called asymmetric polarization, which no one believes. That the data is clear on this. The Democrats have moved slightly to the left over the last 20 or 30 years. The, the Republicans have moved so far to the right 
over the last 30 or 40 years. Consider yeah. the fact, by the way, that 60% of white evangelicals in this country today, 60% of white evangelicals in America today want to reduce legal immigration to our country by 50%. 60% of white evangelicals want to reduce legal immigration to this country by 60, by 50%. You cannot tell me, you cannot look me in the face and say, I just want them to come here the right way. You do not want that. You want less brown people in America. That is what you're telling me in polling data after polling data. 35% of white evangelicals supported family separation policies on the border. Yeah. 35 That was the highest of any religious group. I mean, you cannot tell me that you don't have antipathy towards people who come from another country. Like it's at some point we have to say like this is not acceptable policy. Like America is a nation of immigrants, and the, what has happened the last ten years, especially, is nativism and nationalism run amok, and that is not Christian, not biblical, and not okay. Yeah, that's the irony. The irony is that yeah. you can't make a, a biblical case for that. We talked the other day about Leviticus yeah. nineteen. How you take, you know, I, I don't need to share the story again, but if you read all of Leviticus nineteen, it's mm -hmm. very clear what the position is. But um, also, as a fiscal conservative, I want to broaden the tax base, open it up, bring people here, let them be paying their taxes. It'll, you know, totally. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, but that, but if you think about it, like, think what Reagan did, Reagan gave sanctuary to, to people from Central America, Nicaraguans who were coming here uh, in the 1980s. He, he banned assault weapons. He raised taxes, right? Like he would not be a Republican today because the party has gone off the rails. Like, yeah. I, I don't know how to say that. And people are like, you're a liberal hack then. I'm not a liberal hack. Right. Well, the name calling is usually the crutch of someone who can't defend their argument. Like, I mean, let's just say that. I mean, but, it is. Um, but I'd be, I'd be very interested to, to, to be looking at the studies that you're looking at, particularly that one about immigration. As someone who's very close to my immigrant roots, it doesn't, it literally doesn't occur to me to look at things that way. So I really, again, I don't mean to sound like Pollyanna, but I do, I find myself like shocked at that you're telling me that 60% of, is it white evangelicals? Yes. Believe Six. in re limiting legal immigration. Yeah. Cutting legal immigration by 50%. Yes. Yeah. So cutting the number of legal immigrants through our country in half. That's yeah, what they want. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've yeah, I mean, my, that's just not my experience or my my story. Like, I, I totally, and, and everywhere I live, our, our country, our, our technology is made better by immigrants, for God's sakes. Like, Apple, Facebook, it's, I mean, it's not that it would, it's, it's, we wouldn't have these things. I knew, Jess, I knew you were a liberal <laughs> Marxist all along. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Marxism, because yeah, I've had ahead. a lot of a lot of experience with Marxism, uh, I worked with uh, with uh, in a Chinese company for ten years. Um, one one thing that I'm very curious about is um, that sort of Western civilization has the underpinnings of understanding concepts like forgiveness and reconciliation. That's not to say mm. that Confucius didn't, right? Because Confucius was all about living in harmony, um, but. Can we have those qualities in our country, especially with the conversations we're having about race, gender? Mm. Can we have forgiveness and reconciliation if we don't have religion, if we don't have religious faith? You know, Liz Bruning from, she's at The Atlantic now. Oh, yeah. She wrote a great piece the Times about how we just do not have a, a way to ask for forgiveness and repentance in, in, in anymore. Like, we don't know how to do that in a meaningful way. Even like, I think I hate the term cancel culture. Where but are I the Christians that are supposed to know how to do that? Because that was given to them as the basis of their faith. Where are they in that? Argument? But I think in some ways they're willing to cancel people faster than anybody else. You know, like the, I think that's the, that's the cry the Republicans make against the Democrats oftentimes. Like they're, they're too like hung up on cancel culture. And I think they are. The democratic party has like no tolerance for people being dumb when they were 18, which makes no sense to me at all. Like, I mean, we're all dumb when we're 18, but at well, the same time. Or, or, or dumb yesterday, not being able to learn from your mistakes. We all make mistakes. And the, the idea there is almost like, I mean, it is Marx. It, I really read it through that prism. It is Absolutely. Marxism. Unless you have proximity to power that gives you forgiveness for that sin of mm -hmm. being human, you, you don't get forgiveness because people don't give each other forgiveness in that construct. I do think liberals fail on this, by the way, because they without religion, they don't have the structure. To, I had a, like a huge debate in class with a student one day who said, if my views today look like, you know, out of step in 20 years, then you should cancel me. And I was like, no, 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 no. Because <laughs> when I was 18, I said the F word referring to people who are homosexual. And I'm not proud of that, but I said it. I will, I will say right now, and if you cancel me, go right ahead. But I was wrong. 
right? And I've changed my views. And I will never say that word again. I'll never say the R word with developmentally disabled people. I'll never say that word again. I said it before and I'm not proud of it, right? But you know what we do? We learn and we do better, right? Like that's what, that's what Christianity teaches me is I'm never complete. I've never arrived. I'm never fully like Christ. Like I'm always trying to be better. And I would go one Good. further than that. I would say that that is the nature of the constitution of this country, that we can a more better. perfect union, right? A yes, more we are, perfect. We have union. a document that allows the evolution of our country, its laws and its governance to match the evolution of its people. So mm -hmm. whether we get browner, blacker, more Muslim, more, more Jewish, whatever, that document gives us the, the ability to flex. And you talk in your book about the distinction of how separation of church and state as a doctrine of the constitution um, is you think it seems to be part of the reason why we've been slower to become more secularized because we don't as easily conflate religion and politics. Although certainly a lot of what we've just talked about now seems to be that we're moving in that direction. It's so funny. The people who want Christian nationalism the most don't realize that America is so Christian because we do not have a state religion. Like the dominant understanding of why America is still as Christian as it is, is because the state never co-opted religion. You know what Americans hate more than anything else is government. Every, I mean, even liberals don't like government that much. So can you imagine we had to pay taxes to a state church? Like how much antipathy and anger would that generate amongst everybody against religion as a whole? By the way, in Germany, they still pay taxes to the church. I mean, in European countries, like their state religion. So by actually separating those two things, I think it actually made religion more robust in America and actually allowed it to stay stronger for longer. The other thing I note is that America has a lot more religious diversity than Europe did. Like very few mm -hmm. parts of America are like one specific strain of Christianity or, you know, the only really outlier there is Utah with Muslim or with uh, with Mormons. But Mormons. most, you know, yeah, most counties in America have like 40% Catholics, but 30% Baptists and then 20% Methodists. So you have like a nice mix of people. So no one feels like they're being outnumbered, like the tyranny of the majority thing. You know, having a, a robust religious market is actually a good thing. And government getting involved in that market would actually have made it worse in the long run. So I actually think that evangelicals, a lot of Christian nationalists actually are sowing the seeds of their own destruction by wanting America to be a Christian nation, right? By like a, a doctrinally- Or even or, believing that we ever were in the sense that we we were not simply founded by deists and people of, of a Christian background or professing Christians, but deists as well. Um, you know, I, th I think that's been a fundamental art point of argument in some circles that I'm in of, of the idea of we will lose God's favor if X, Y, Z. And it usually has to do with becoming more worldly, right? Mm -hmm. um, the idea that, that any man-made entity can be a Christian nation given some sort of um, special dispensation by the Almighty Ooh, I'm not there. I don't know that that's scriptural. And if, if, if anything, I would argue that the, the country that is, it's, is Israel. It's not America. I thought Revelation 21 and 22 is describing Fifth Avenue during Christmas time. <laughs> no, is that not? Is that no, not but I mean, you're talking about repla replacement th th theology. And that's where, you know, I think as a person of Jewish heritage, um, who's a Christian, you really start to see some ugly things inside the, the church. Um, and I'm always, I'm still, I still continue to be shocked. I don't know, you know, like I come coming across like such a rube here today, but I'm just like, seriously, like, where does this stuff come from? Where, where do people get their material? Yeah. It's if you go to a small town church in America today, there's probably a 90% chance you're going to see a, an American flag on the, on the, on the podium somewhere, sure. which, which is to me is like actually, really Idolatry. offends my religious sensibilities, right? Because yeah. I believe we should have no other God before God, right? And there are people in my, and I've actually, I said this from the pulpit one time, the problem with American Christianity is we're much more likely to recite the Pledge of Allegiance yeah. in church than say the Apostles' Creed, right? Like, like, why is one good and one is bad? Like I was taught, have no other gods before me, including my, you know, my country. I love my country. I'm an American. Do I think America is the greatest country on earth? Absolutely. Do I think America has have terrible problems? Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. I heard one person say, and I think about this all the time. You go, the problem with America is Republicans love America too much and Democrats don't love it enough. And so I'm always trying to live in the tension of you know what I mean? Like seeing America for the greatness that it is, but also understanding that it is not a perfect union, that we're working to become a more perfect union. Yeah. 
And if you don't see your flaws, you can never work on your flaws, right? You can never move. Well, the Mennonites are really good at this, right? That yes. They're citizens of the world. They're pacifists. Um, it can be a little bit challenging to be in that environment, as I've shared with listeners before. Uh, during 9-11, my mother was a teacher in the Mennonite school system, and it was incredibly difficult to navigate the, the, the sense of patriotism that many people were feeling in that context and, the, and that she felt. But I think they do have that part largely right, that uh, that we are not citizens of anywhere, uh, but where our, our faith and our allegiance to God takes us. I'm going to, can I tell a quick story? Sure. About Mennonites. There's this great and book. And by the way, that doesn't mean I'm not patriotic. I still love my Ooh. country. Where's my flag? I just have to clarify that <laughs> because I think a lot of veterans will interpret that as, oh, you know, I, I, I fought and bled for that, that flag because yeah. that is, you know, that's part of the motivation. But should it be? There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of was Babylonians or Persians that fought and bled for that big statue at Nebuchadnezzar too. That's absolutely true. I, but I don't mean to be disrespectful about uh, veterans either. I'm sorry. No, that, that I was we all we all know what you mean. Yeah. There's a story uh, by by Shane Hips in a book called Flickering Pixels where he grew up and he was a, he was a pastor of Mennonite congregation and he had this guy come up and give his testimony. He was born in 1925, so he got drafted in World War II, but he was a Mennonite. Right. Which means he was a he could not fight in war because he's a pacifist. Right. Yeah. But to be a conscientious objector in World War Two was to be unpatriotic because you're fighting the Nazis, for goodness sakes. Right. Like a, a justifiable evil in the world. And he goes, no, my faith teaches me to be a pacifist no matter what. Violence is not what we do. So what the army did for him is put him in uh, a psychiatric hospital with the most violent patients in America as sort of a punishment. And put all the Mennonite men in these psychiatric hospitals as a way to punish them for not serving their country patriotically. Well, what those guys realized was those kids, those 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 men who had been in the psychiatric hospital had been basically been beaten by the nurses and orderlies for years because they were violent and they responded with violence with violence. So what the Mennonite men said was, we are not going to use violence against these men ever again. And what they actually did was create an entirely new way to treat people who are severely mentally ill in this country by not returning violence on violence, which actually became the mainstream way in which we treat people who are severely mentally ill today and have violent tendencies. We do not respond with violence in turn because it perpetuates the cycle. And he said this guy gave this amazing speech about how he got he got just beat up and broken arms and blacked eyes by all these mentally ill people beating him up, and he refused to fight back and he refused to return violence or violence. And everyone at the, at the end was just you know in awe and enraptured by this 80 year old man telling this life story about all the good things that he did. And he said, "I'll never forget the last thing that he said before he walked off the stage. He looked at all of us. He goes, and that's my story, and that's how I live my life. But I might be wrong, oh, and walked man. off. Wow." And I thought, like, that's it, right? Like, that's the humbleness that we're supposed to have as human beings. Like, this is this is how I live my life, and this is what I believe about the world. But at the end of the day, now comes the mystery, right? When I pass from this life to the next, that's the, the mysterion, right, as, as they would say in the Catholic Church. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm trying my best, but I could be totally wrong, but I'm going to try my best to be to do as best I can with what I have. And whether it ends up good or bad is really, you know, not up to us. And I think that's just such a – a beautiful way to think about life that we're we always might be wrong that humbleness you can be too much of a lot of things in this world but too humble is definitely not one of them and i think that's something in america by the way yeah. as a country we could do a lot better with yeah <laughs> so i have a question about the nuns that i i think will lead into a question uh, just that you have um my question is is more in your study of the nuns folks who are non-religious or no particular religion are there any transcendent moorings, ethical moorings? You know, for, for someone like me or um, even Buddhist friends, there are practices or there are scriptures or there are these moorings that, that transcend us and our own <laughs> feeling that day. I'm wondering if you've come across uh, more transcendent ethical moorings that nuns, that, that it's not dependent on an influencer's whim that day. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the answer is no. I mean, I think the, the problem, though, is the nuns are so diverse. Like in the book, I talk about how like atheists and agnostics yeah. are like one thing. Yeah. And then nothing in particular is or something else entirely. 
And I, I, I'm actually, as a social scientist, I'm actually a lot less worried about atheists and agnostics than I am about nothing in particulars. Because atheist agnostics are, have very high levels of education. They have a reasonably high income. They're actually politically engaged at a very high level. Um, atheists are actually the most politically engaged group in America today in terms of rallies, meetings, donations, working for campaigns, that kind of stuff. No one outdoes the atheists on those accounts. And agnostics are not far behind. The nothing in particulars are the least educated religious subgroup in America today. Only 20% of them have a four-year college degree. It's 47% of atheists and 44% of agnostics. 60% um, of nothing in particular is make less than $50,000 a year, which means most of them live in poverty. So they have no education. They have, uh, you know, a lot of them live in poverty. They're struggling in every possible way where atheists and agnostics have like disposable income and they got, you know, they're, they're kind of living this liberal utopia in a lot of ways. Nothing particulars are, by the way, here's the other thing. Atheists are 6% of America. Agnostics are 6% of America. Nothing in particular are 20% of all Americans. They're basically the same size as white evangelicals and white Catholics. Wow. I mean, one in five Americans are nothing in particular. So three in five nuns are nothing in particulars. One's atheist, one agnostic, three out of five are nothing in particulars. And they are unmoored, untethered, unattached to American society. So when I see things like you know, like people are spending more time on the internet, being radicalized by the internet. That's exactly the kind of people I think about are the nothing in particulars because they have nothing in their life that sort of creates structure and order and a way to think about things. And they don't have an adult in the room, you know, the figurative adult in the room to say, we don't say that. We don't believe that. We don't go there. That is wrong. And I think atheists and agnostics community. actually have, yeah, You're they, don't have, a they don't have a community because they don't have a church. They don't have a community group. They don't have a neighborhood watch, whatever it is, because they're not actually involved. Mm -hmm. That's exactly they're not what socially I'm involved either. No, so not they, they're not actually replacing religion with politics, for example. No. Um, they, so they, they don't even have an alternative. They have nothing. So they have they're nothing. completely apathetic. Yes. And it's terrifying. And they don't have hope. No, why, I if don't. They don't I, have hope. Why? Why would they not want hope? I mean, I think they're. I think of that God size hole analogy and maybe it's overused, but I, I do think that People want hope. People want to get up in the morning and have a reason to do so. But I think their guiding principles, institutions are bad because institutions have screwed them over their entire lives, right? Education didn't work for them. The job market didn't think. So here's what I think nothing in particular are by and large. They're the people 40 years ago who would work in the factory, make a middle-class income and be part of polite society. But globalization ruined that, that thing that their parents did and their mm -hmm. grandparents did, right? Which is go to high school, get a job in the factory, go on vacation once a year, make decent money, raise your kids, have a good life. Those same jobs that would pay $30 now pay $12. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're not living that good life anymore. And they feel like American society has left them behind. American education has left them behind. The American economy has left them behind. They don't trust politicians and they also don't trust pastors and churches. Right. So anti institution is what guides their life. And they're searching. I think a lot of them are still searching for something. And if you look at the data, they're not actually that turned off with religion. I think like 25 or 30 percent actually. Yeah, go to that was, I found that very interesting because to me, you were sort of directing people who have an agenda to, to, to spread the gospel or to expand their churches towards this group of people as fertile ground. They, so I had panel data, which asked the same people, the same questions in 2010, 12 and 14. Um, like 98% of atheists were still atheists four years later. And most of them who switched became agnostics, right? So now they're, they're still nuns. Yeah, they're committed. It's an ideology. They have it a is commitment an ideology. to the ideology, but the agnostics nothing in particular the don't. Exactly. So They're sixty open. percent. They are open, and that's the key. But are they also searching? I think they are because the data says that twenty about twenty percent of them over a four year period of time went back to Christianity. So I mean, that's yeah. and think about it, that's twenty percent of twenty percent of America. That's four percent of America we're talking about. I mean, that's a huge chunk. So this reminds me of something um, uh, Tim Keller talked yeah. about in an interview um, where he talked about, and, and for those of our listeners who don't know who Tim Keller is. Um, I would say he's one of the probably most relevant modern day theologians in the Protestant tradition, mm -hmm. um, but also a very thoughtful person. He is not going to rip and read. Um, and he and he has changed. He was asked in this podcast interview about how he has changed the way he preaches the gospel through different trends in society. And he is now taught. He, he, he says, now I'm on this third iteration where I, I talk about identity because everything in our culture today is about how you identif identify and with whom. And 
And so the answer for the Christian or the Jesus follower is I identify with Christ. It gives you an orientation on, on how to, you know, and on how, how to behave, how to be directed, um, and, and how to interact with other people. To me, what you're describing is a bunch of people looking for identity. Yes, I think that is, but doing a very poor job of figuring it out though, at the same time. Yeah. Open to figuring it out. Maybe if it comes to them, but they're not actively searching. And I think because of technology, it's easier to not have to search anymore because you can entertain yourself to use a Neil Postman entertaining ourselves to death, right? Like you don't have to leave the house anymore. So we're losing that social interaction as well. So they don't even get a chance to figure out who they are at the same time. It's, but you know, let's talk about identity for a second. The share of Americans who identify self-identify as evangelical has not changed in the last 12 years, but the percentage of self-identified evangelicals who never go to church has risen 50% in the last 12 years. Like the term evangelical. They're, well, they're, yeah, because the, the label is loaded. And also exactly. I think they're being turned off by some of uh, some of the mixing and matching that's going on in the evangelical church, which brings us back to the conversation we've had with Elizabeth about, you know, some, some churches really getting away from preaching taking care of the widow, the orphans, and, and getting much more towards, oh, you're supposed to have a good life. You know, the, the prosperity gospel. If you think about the, the pastors that were visible around Donald Trump, these were not people that were preaching humility. <laughs> yeah, he was asked if you ever asked for forgiveness before, and he goes, no, I don't think I need to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, oh, at, at, at its core, <laughs> you you have to wonder, right? And I, I do know people who who have vouched for the fact that they, you know, they they have, I do know Christian believers who, to their core, believe that he has made a profession either to them or some something. Uh, I haven't I haven't seen it myself, so I can't weigh in from personal experience. But certainly, that comment is not consistent with the Bible. He no. is the chosen one. <laughs> oh wow, that's dangerous language, isn't it, Corey? My goodness oh. gracious! Because again, it goes back to the idea: if he's the chosen one, then everything in in, in service of that is justifiable. Because but he that's was, what happened: is there was a takeover, and mm. and as as Corey has talked about, I mean, with with even at CPAC, your 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 Facebook post about the golden statue of Donald Trump, <laughs> um, you know how how is it that Christians stood by that and didn't see the the <laughs> golden calf? I yeah. mean. Yeah. <laughs> Either they never read the story or they never learned it in church, but come on, like that's, I, I don't know. In my family, that's part of the fabric of, of, uh, you know, of just sort of historical knowledge. Like, you know, how, how can you grow up you know, understanding Western civilization and not know that story? Yeah. I mean, the, the other one is I, I referred to it before as the Daniel three, the, the, the Nebuchadnezzar golden statue. I mean, that, that's got to just send all kinds of fire alarms going off. It's a four alarm fire going on. So, but um, we have beat that topic up quite a bit. And uh, <laughs> we've had a good conversation. I know we could talk for, for hours more. I could go. Yeah, definitely. But I do feel like I should kind of wrap it up here. Um, I, I, I think we got to most of what um, I had planned to ask you. I guess the, the question is, uh, Corey, do you have anything else to add before we let him turn the tables on us? <laughs> Um, I did have one follow-up question about the Trumpification of churches. Do you think there's any turning back or has the evangelical movement become an extension of the socio-political movement that's dominated by this one thing? Yeah. So there, you, there's, this, there's this theory in IR, international relations, called long cycle theory, which kind of argues that the world goes through periods of a lot of war and then a lot of peace, and they kind of cycle back and forth over time. Mm-hmm. And that kind of theory sort of bled into the, like the, the literature on polarization in America. That's like long cycle where we have like lots of polarization. Then we kind of go back to more compromise. Like if you look back to the sixties in America, we had a lot of co- compromise, like in the 19, like in the Lyndon Johnson administration, there was more inter-party voting than ever before. And now we're at the absolute polar opposite of that. And now long cycle theory would say, well, we'll cycle back to, you know, the 1960s again at some point. But I think that the sort of thing that breaks that is social media. 
Mm. The, the technological revolution is something we've never seen before. And I think it literally alters everything. Like we're just beginning to understand the impact it's having now. Like we've got to understand like social is only like 15 years old, like in a yeah. meaningful way. And a lot of the apps who are using today existed for less than five years, like TikTok and Snapchat and those kind of things are not that old. Like we don't even understand them in any meaningful way yet. So does, do those applications like break long cycle theory forever? Like, will we never like vacillate back and forth? Would it all be one direction? I see nothing in the data that shows any moderation is happening at all. In fact, I see nothing but the opposite. If you look at data on things like, was the election of 2020 stolen? The fact that like 70% of Republicans say yes, I think tells you everything you need to know about American democracy, where we are right now. It's all about winning, not about democracy. You're depressing me, Ryan. You're going to have to end it on a, on a high note. Yeah. Guess give what? Me, give the, us some hope. The kingdom of God has survived much worse than Donald Trump. <laughs> Wow. I feel like you might have said that before. I, I might have, um, but <laughs> I, at some point I have to understand that my job is to, if you want to change the world, I went out to change the world and all I ended up changing was myself, right? Yeah. Like at yeah. the end of the day, change starts with me and it starts with you and it starts with all of us. And my job is to make the world a better place and build the kingdom of God wherever I go, right? Be loving, be kind, be serving, be peaceful, be gracious. And, you know, I think if we all did that at the aggregate level, you know, we'd get, we get systemic change in this country. But at some point I cannot convince people the vaccine does not cause autism or does not give you the mark of the beast. I cannot convince you that Donald Trump is not a good human being. I can't convince anyone of that. My job is to be a truth teller, to be a neutral arbiter, to try to say, here's what the data says, and you can do with it whatever you want. And if you change, that's great, but it's not my responsibility to make you change. And I think that's where I've kind of gotten in my life at this point. I did notice that once I got the vaccine, I, I now speak Russian fluently. I, I've never studied it. Is that is that weird? Did you get the Sputnik version, the Russian version that I, doesn't I work did. apparently? <laughs> I did. Okay. Wow, we learned way more than we wanted to about your vaccine history there. But, uh, that's why you were laid out. Um, I do think I do think it's important to say that the the book also for for people of faith does end prescriptively. What yeah, can we do? It's great. Um, who should we be talking to? Um, how should we be talking to them? And I I do find that encouraging. I didn't expect to find encouragement in this book, actually, uh, especially after the first four chapters where you, you beat me over the head with uh, statistics that were not incredibly encouraging. Um, because I, I think I have a personal bias towards having experienced the power of faith and hope in a very deeply personal way. I do have a bias towards thinking that it, it can help people live better. So I went on, people, I, listen, I went on the 538 podcast, I think, and said religion, I think religion is a force for good in the world. And oh my gosh. You would have thought I said like Heil Hitler or yeah. something. Oh, you know, man. But like it, at some point you have to you have to speak your truth, right? And say like, I know what the conventional wisdom is, but there's also conventional wisdom on the other side that says that what you believe is basically based on social media hype and hysteria. And I think religion on balance is a good, and I said, like go to Europe, religion, Western Europe is completely secular in most places and are all their problems solved? Do they live in some sort of utopia where nationalism is not also on the rise and racism and economic inequality are not also terrible? Guess what? They are. Because when you get rid of religion, you know what people are going to figure out? Another tribe to join. And mm -hmm. for some, it's soccer, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. which is better, religion or soccer? I mean, I would argue that religion is a better force for the world than, than soccer hooligans are. So <laughs> I'm not at all convinced. Uh, you know why, why religion causes conflict? Because people want to join tribes. So mm -hmm. don't blame it on religion, blame it on human nature, right? Whether it be race or mm -hmm. age or country of origin or whatever it is, we want to be us versus them. And religion becomes an easy foil to create us versus them. If you get rid of religion, people are going to find another tribal tribe to join and it's not going to be any better. In some ways, I think it's going to be worse because there's nothing transcendental or transcendent about soccer or about nationalism or about your race or your gender or what party you vote for. None of those things will save you. None of those things will give you purpose. And I think religion literally gives billions of people purpose every day, not just today, but all throughout human history. And to disregard that is to disregard the lives of tens of billions of human beings. We are not in some way more enlightened than they were 50 years ago, you know, by throwing off religion. Like we've, we're, those are sheep and I've moved beyond that. 
Tell my grandma you moved beyond that. The woman who went, was 103 years old, went to church every Sunday, lost two husbands, buried two kids, and got through it because she believed that God loved her. Tell her that she's a sheep. Tell her that. That is disrespectful, okay? There are billions of people who do good and serve people and love their world because God commands them to do that. Don't disregard that. I think yeah. that's so it's so patronizing and it really, really annoys me about militant atheists, especially, are so annoying. I mean, they're worse than I think militant evangelicals in some ways. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you if you're mad I'm trying to convert you to Christianity, then I should be mad at you for trying to convert me away from it. You yeah. know, like it's the same thing. Don't think you're morally justified by doing that because you're not. You know, I think the problem is that no one will say these things, though, right, in polite society anymore is that like, oh, you know, especially on the left, it's cool to have no religion. It's edgy or all that stuff. You know what's edgy? Believing in something, yeah. right? Having a bigger purpose. In you know life. what? I, I think I figured out why you're not a hit at dinner parties. But if you came to D.C. <laughs> with the same passion that you do there, I gosh, I think you might just, you know, take over the room. Please do come. Please come with that. That was a good, that was a great discussion and um and you know my my personal bias i've already said is is towards faith but also because because religion explains so much about culture and people and in order to be better at understanding others you do have to embrace that dimension of people whether you agree with it is secondary but you have to acknowledge it and try to understand it Absolutely. Um, i think that's fundamental to to creating a better world and, and, and learning from each other, which of course we're, we're really struggling to do right now in this country. <laughs> I laugh with discomfort. Um, any questions that you want to ask us? What happens when we die? Oh my gosh. Why did we open the door to that? Do we have any certainty? I'm going to be eaten by the fishes or by the worms because I'm not going to be embalmed. You know what Keanu Reeves said one time when he was asked that question? Keanu Reeves, who's not a Christian at all, said he was asked by Dave Letterman, what happens when you die? And he goes, I hope the people that love me will miss me. And I was like, holy crap, is that not profound? So, Corey, what's your answer? I was just starting to say that I don't have a ton of control over that. There there are indications. There are hints in scripture. Uh, and I, I some of them seem coherent and cohesive, which is why I'm a Christian. And I would say that the concept of tikkun olam really guides me uh, that I, I, it may be true. It may not be true. I, I don't want to bet. I don't want to bet on the opposite of it, that it's true. And I, I've been on the wrong side of it. So Can you remind us again what, t- what tikkun olam means, because I'm uh, blanking. It, it, he, heal the world. You know, okay. I believe that this is God's creation. Um, I believe that I'm a part of God's creation. And I believe that. OK, so. Oh gosh, what's his name? He he wrote a book on um, the drama of doctrine. Kevin Kevin Van Hooser. He said it this way: uh, the story of the Bible is still being written, and we're in it, right? So I, it's a blessing to be a part of God's re- big redemption plan. After after Genesis two, you know the 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 or uh, Genesis three really. The rest of the story is about how God is forming this people initially the people descendant from, from Abraham and then the people around Jesus to, to participate in his, his grand redemption plan. So I don't know what happens after I die, but I do know what's happening right now and that it's a blessing for me to participate in redemptive conversations and redemptive work in, in the hands and the feet, as you've referred to it, Jess, as, you know, it, that, that's the part that, that I know. And I have good evidence to believe that it leaves some sort of a positive thing after me in this creation. Um, I also believe that what happens after I die and the afterlife, there's a very this worldly thing that that's, that's happening there um, that some of the evangelical um, what, do, dogma, is it dogma or doctrine? But it's like, there's a otherworldly thing that they're talking about. And to me, that just sounds more platonic or Socratic than, than scriptural. So I think there's, you know, Jesus bodily rose from the dead. You know, he was the first fruits of the resurrection. So I think there's something that makes more sense to me than going to some airy thing in the sky, otherworldly thing. You don't want wings? What? You don't want wings? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that stuff, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to piece some of the evidence together that, that makes sense. Does that, does that answer your question, Ryan? No, but... <laughs> 
That's all I want. I wanted to hear you philosophize for a second, Tori. That makes me happy. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure that you really he needed much of an invitation to do that, Ryan. That's why that uh, that's that's why he has this podcast. <laughs> <sighs> what happens after you die? He creates Jeez. the world and we just live in it. Well, listen, um, it's been a, a great pleasure. I, I feel like we're not ending on a terribly final note because we've asked a very esoteric question in there at the end. Leave it to a philosopher to do that. <laughs> okay, let me answer that question one other way. Oh my gosh, here we go. Let me think about that. And can I circle back with you? That is such a philosopher thing to say at the end. <laughs> or Jen Psaki, one of the two. We have Jen to also- Saki. circle back. Yeah. So we have to also ask, you, you got a thing coming up. You mentioned it earlier on in the conversation, yeah. but the book. So um, book number two is coming out in March of 2022. It's called 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. It's like 20 little bite-sized chapters, about 2,000 words each, couple graphs, kind of busting a lot of preconceptions that people have about religion in America and politics, and how those two things interact. Um, things like evangelicals are in decline. Statistically, that's not true. Um, I'm writing a chapter right now on how black Protestants are, are not liberals. Everyone thinks black Protestants are liberals and that's absolutely fundamentally false. They're Democrats. They're not liberals though. But there is a war on Christmas, right? There is no, that is not a chapter <laughs> at all. Um, you know, like radical conversion, uh, you know, people have a radical conversion experience as adults. That is very incredibly rare, you know, so it's just, Oh, um, that Donald Trump was not the favorite of white evangelicals in the 2016 primary. There's like this narrative that bounced around like, no, they really – the reason that he got nominated is because of non-attending Republicans are the one who, who voted for him in the primary. That is fundamentally false. Um, Donald Trump was the favorite of white evangelical Republicans at every attendance level except for those who attended more than once a week, which were only 8% of all Republicans. Mm. So weekly attending white evangelicals chose Trump over Cruz by like 15 points, and Cruz only beat Trump amongst more than weekly by eight points. He wow. literally ran the table amongst white evangelicals. Very impressed by your um, memory of numbers, by the way. Ryan this is Birch. my brand. Um, so <laughs> yeah. this is what I do. That's good. That's good. You got a good grasp of it. So it come March 2022. Yes, um, correct. We'll, we'll be expecting our advanced copy so we can have you back between now and then. And if you want to try it out, if you want to test any ideas, please come back. I'd yeah. love to have you back. <laughs> I'll have an answer about where we go after we die by then. By next Tuesday. I'll have it all figured oh, out. Boy. Oh, and how do we find you online? Uh, at Ryan Burge on Twitter is where like the hub of my digital world. I, I, it's the only social media I really do. Um, I post just graphs. All I do is make graphs about religion and post them uh, online. That's how I, I got, that's my brand. That's all I do. I don't tweet about what I eat for breakfast or my kids or my family or anything else. 98% of it is just graphs about religion. That's it. So if you like what I'm talking about right now and you want to learn more about the world, I hopefully make that possible on my Twitter at Ryan Burge. Um, my website is ryanburge.net. Stuff about the book is there. My papers, my published journal articles, I have all the copies are on there. You can grab them for free. You don't have to pay the journals and all that stuff. Ah. Yeah, I'm breaking the law. I don't care because copyright's dumb when it comes to journals because guess what? I don't get paid to write for them and they charge people to read my stuff. It's a terrible business model, so blow it up. <laughs> um, that's also why I started writing books. Cause guess what? When you buy a book, I get paid and I like getting paid for my work. So let's, you know, let's go down that road. So, um, and then you can buy the nuns where they came from, who they are, where they're going at all fine booksellers is also at Barnes and Noble across the country. They order copies and, and, and Kindle and Kindle. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and an audio book is coming out. I've been told by my publisher, but you're not reading it. No, they wouldn't let me read it, which I was really disappointed in because I have such a fine and not very fast speaking voice. <laughs> Sounds like you might have, yeah, been told this otherwise. Is, I have a new question now. Oh if, dear. If if I buy a book on Kindle with Bitcoin, does the tree make a noise in the woods? <laughs> Someone asked, it's like, what is what is Bitcoin? Someone said, it's like, if your refrigerator ran all the time of uh, solving Sudoku puzzles that spit out tokens to let you buy heroin. That's what Sorry. Bitcoin is. There you go. You guys, I think, are distantly related. Um, on that note, um, I feel like I've got to be the adult in the room here and rein it all in, tie it Thank up with you. a bow. Uh, Ryan, a, really a pleasure to have you. Much, uh, many more surprises than even I could foresee uh, you and Corey are definitely kindred spirits and I might, I might have a little, I might be able to hang out with you guys again. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, uh, I just sit back and listen and learn, but that's, that's a good thing too. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. It's been thanks. an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thanks Ryan. Thanks Jess. You bet. Thank you for joining us today. 
If you appreciate what you heard here, please go to iTunes or anywhere you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating and leave a review. That really helps move us up the chart so others can find out what we're up to here. For Ronnie Nathan, I'm Corey Nathan, and we've been talking politics and religion without killing each other. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam. <laughs>